All right, good, good afternoon class. Um, checking in, I think I mentioned that I would be recording some some comments because I felt like we didn't get quite as far as I wanted to today in class. And uh, I have already sent out your announcement for um, tomorrow's assignment. But here we are today, as you'll recall, we were looking at um, different memory systems that have been evident in societies throughout uh, world history. And uh, we started off, you know, talking today a little bit about what memory systems are and a little bit about how we might try to tell the story of, quote unquote, the past shared by all humans. And so I already talked about this and we described in some detail what memory systems are. But we also told a little bit about, um, you know, we're lingering a little longer on this issue of how state controlled cultural memory. Because the power of history, history is, is a memory system that has been in existence throughout world history. And it's not the only memory system by any means, but history tends to be a powerful current. And I think one way of saying it is that the interests within a given society that control the collective memory of a people, those interests have a power that other interests within that society probably do not. And so it may sound a little conspiratorial, but we looked back um, and we, we saw some examples in class today of, of where that is evident. And I think we could come up with some uh, examples based on our um, conversations in class as well. So let's see, I'm gonna try to make sure this works. I'm gonna have to do this the old fashioned way. So I'll do this. Hopefully it'll work. Okay, I'm going to click there. We left off today talking about the, the Mande, uh, the society out of which the Mali Empire, which is a very powerful West African empire, uh, emerges around, you know, we're looking at roughly the time that the Maya go into decline. We start to see the emergence of the Mande. Of course, they wouldn't have been aware of one another because they were separated by the vast Atlantic Ocean. Um, but the Mande are another example of a powerful society in world history that had a memory system. We talked about the role of the griot and how they sort of served at the interest and leisure of the king and their power of memory, the stories they told, the lineages of great rulers gone before were a way of both directly and indirectly legitimizing the rule of the king. And so this is a powerful memory system that was um, one of relatively few memory systems in the uh, world of the uh, Mande Mali Empire. And so uh, it's worth noting. But now we'll get into some new uh, area. And if we apply our same questions that we asked of the Mande and we apply them to the Inca, we see that similarly, the Inca also were a largely oral tradition um, society in, ter in terms of their uh, memory systems. But they used an interesting mnemonic device called the Quipu, which the Quipu is a uh, sort of system of knotted strings that various messengers and runners throughout the Inca Empire, which was a vast empire, spanned thousands of miles of trails and roads. And these runners and messengers were absolutely integral to holding together um, this one of a kind uh, empire. And the Quipu were like, you can think of it as maybe an early version of a, a database that helped them keep track of records. This could be things like government censuses that um, control or that uh, reflected the population of a given um, settlement within the empire and of course that would be in, important for tax purposes for um, determining sort of a military draft which for the Inca was referred to as the Mita um, and so the Kipu is one example of a device that helped them maintain their memory system. But then they also had important people known as the Amauta who were sort of like the government sponsored teachers and 
managers of Incan history. And so if you are a privileged member of Inca society, if you're part of the aristocracy, in all likelihood your, um, your children, your aristocratic child, would be educated, and education was a very um, special privilege, not available to, to everyone, but the Amauta would be responsible for educating the children of the elite. And they did this in a way that imparted stories, the collective memory of the Inca in the past. And by virtue of only a relative few being mindful of the past and the history of the Inca people, those the interests of the relative few were fairly well served. It's fascinating. I mean, not altogether unlike in the United States today, um, the way uh, military education, um, you know, military prep schools, which are some of the better schools, secondary schools in the country, are preparing a generation of sort of leading edge elites or aristocrats in the United States who might then go on to an Ivy League education where um, doesn't you can, it's not that you can't be powerful and influential in the United States without an Ivy League education, although it's worth noting that a lot of the more powerful people within our society, the senatorial class, presidents, so on and so forth, they oftentimes do have Ivy League schools in their pedigree or their background. So here we see that uh, with the Inca, again, another oral tradition. And then we can move on here and talk just briefly. We'll close here with ancient Greece. Um, and Herodotus is a really important member of classical age Greek society. So go back, let's say 2,500 years ago or so. And uh, he's worthy of note because he's really one of the first historians in a somewhat modern sense of the term, meaning someone who records and writes down their findings. And Herodotus existed at a really interesting historical crossroads because oftentimes what his writing was, was simply recording the oral tradition stories of the people that he would come in contact with as he trip, pardon me, throughout the Mediterranean, the coast of North Africa, the coast of Western Asia. He was in, in some ways a global presence. He, he, he took in quite a bit of what um, the known world of that time had to offer in terms of stories and reflections upon the past. But he's sort of a crossover because he's writing them down. So in some ways written history in Herodotus' age starts to have a little bit of a greater influence and greater um, significance attached to it because now the recordings of the past are more fixed. They can't be improvised and altered and changed such as they could in the oral tradition. So there's a, a really interesting story of, um, of a memory system that starts to trend toward written. And then I'll just leave this to you to think about. There are a number of other societies that we could have highlighted in class today. <clears throat> and had time permitted, we would have gone through and I would have had you just choose two or three of the other societies, most of which are written um, memory system societies. Uh, but I wanted you to be just thinking about how the power of history is also a function of the memory system that's used to disseminate or distribute it. And I might leave you with the question of how is it that how would you describe the memory system in the United States if you were to ask how we are delivered our history? Is it, does it follow certain predictable lines or is it a little bit more of a um, sort of smorgasbord or mixed bag of different strategies? With that, we'll stop.